Okay, over the last uh, three weeks, we have been uh, kind of sneaking up on Lamentations. We, uh, we saw how for centuries, the people of Israel, they were unfaithful to God. I mean, despite God's just clear, repeated warnings to them, that unfaithfulness would bring disaster. He, he's told them this. This is going to be the result. Despite that, they almost constantly rebelled against him, and they engaged in all kinds of idolatry, evil practices. Uh, we've gone through that, and I hope you have a sense of that. Now you can see how they had rejected God so strongly. Uh, the people had just gone right against what he had told them to do and what he had warned them not to do. Then after the Babylonian assault, you know, that they, they, you had really in 605, you had Daniel and his companions taken. And then you had this assault in 598, 597, where the city was spared, but it was a serious assault on Judah by Nebuchadnezzar. And a number of, of leading citizens were taken away, uh, the prophet Ezekiel being among them. But after that, uh, there was a time you, you had... The, Judah then becomes what, in even, to an even greater extent, a Babylonian vassal. Just means a, a, a nation that is under the other one and serving it. And so from 598, 597, Judah is to an even greater extent a Babylonian vassal. And then Nebuchadnezzar's hand picked king, uh, the throne named Zedekiah, he eventually rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, which brings this fierce retaliation in 587, 586. And that's when the city is destroyed. And you have then more people uh, taken away uh, in, in, into captivity into uh, the nation of Babylonia. Jerusalem was destroyed. More Israelites are exiled. And Lamentations is a collection of five poems, four of which are acrostics, which mourns the loss of that city. And as I've said, you know, you just have to understand what Jerusalem was to the nation of Israel. Uh, you, you know, to, to get a grip on how painful this loss was for them. As I said last week, there's a, a tradition that predates the first century that attributes the book of Lamentations to the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah may have written it. It's just one of these kinds of things, since Lamentations is silent about its authorship, uh, it's just uh, impossible to be certain or to have some strong convictions about it. Jeremiah, as I said, he, he may have been, he may have composed the book. He was a great prophet who wrote other laments. We know that in Second Chronicles 35, 25. He was an eyewitness to Jerusalem's fall. So you say, okay, I mean, he seems to, to fit, but you just can't be certain because we don't have anything that, that clearly ties into it. There's some Comments in chapter 3 that some people think point to Jeremiah, but I don't think they necessarily do. So you're just in a, in a situation. He may have written it, but we can't be confident that he did. Now, whether it was Jeremiah or another inspired writer, the author of Lamentations appears to have been an eyewitness to the events just from the description. You know, he doesn't come out and say, you know, I'm, I'm an eyewitness, but just from the description, it seems that he's somebody who personally witnessed these things. He was a profound theologian. And that he understood clearly the connection between what was happening to Jerusalem and what God had said. So he, he was an eyewitness, he was a theologian, he was a poet of great skill, and he was somebody who loved his country. You can see this as he uh, mourns what has happened to the nation of Judah. So whoever the inspired writer is, whether it's Jeremiah or someone else, seems to have these four characteristics. Now, Lamentations, is, it's composed in the aftermath of the fall of Jerusalem, but it's not clear how soon afterward. Clearly, it's after the fall of Jerusalem, but how soon is, is up in the air. The vivid impressions that you get, especially in the first four chapters, these vivid impressions and the emotionally charged nature of these laments, as if you read it, you, you know. Uh, it, it leads most scholars to believe that it was written soon after the fall. Now, what soon means, you have, you know, year, two years. I mean, we're, somewhere there's some, it's, the events seem fairly fresh in the author's mind. But again, that's a subjective assessment. Uh, now, Jerusalem, as I said, Jerusalem was, of course, it was the, it was the center uh, of Judah. It was, a, it was a commercial and religious center of the nation. It was the heart of the nation's identity. It was more than Washington, D.C. for us. 
You see, it was the national identity. It was a religious focus. So much was wrapped up in the, in the city of Jerusalem. And, you know, you even had people who thought, listen, God will protect Jerusalem because that's the site of his special presence. He dwells there in the temple. He had defended it in 701 against the Assyrian assault. God will not let anything because it is so precious to him. And so you can just see when, when Jerusalem is in rubble, lying in ruins, how difficult that would be. As we read last week in 2 Kings chapter 25, when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem after a lengthy siege, is about 18 months, they had surrounded the city, cut off all that's going in there, uh, which is a, a brutal thing for the people inside. But after they had conquered the city, they killed people, they burned down the temple and every significant house in the city. They broke down the city's walls, they took items that were used in the temple, and they carried all but the poorest people into exile into Babylonia. So here you are in that city, city destroyed, vacant people taken away, survivors remaining in the rubble, and you can just imagine what life was like uh, emotionally, physically in that situation. What I want to do, I want to read chapter 1, and then I'm going to come back and just talk about some things in chapter 1. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. If I remember, I want to change a couple of things, which I will indicate to you when I put up the verses on the, on the board. But I thought we ought to read the chapter, since they're separate poems. I'll read chapter 1, and then go back through it and say some things. Chapter 1, verse 1, English Standard Version. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night. With tears on her cheeks, among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile after affliction and hard servitude. That's where I changed one of the things there. She dwells now among the nations, but finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. All her gates are desolate. Her priests groan. Her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head. Her enemies prosper because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers from days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her, her foes gloated over her. They mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore, she became filthy. All who honored her despise her. For they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and her face turns away. Her uncleanness is in her skirts. She took no thought of her future. Therefore, her fall is terrible. She has no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for an enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things. For she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O oh Lord, and see, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire into my bones. He made it descend. 
He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint all the, all the day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke. By his hand they were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. He caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I cannot withstand. The Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. My eyes flow with tears for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands but there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should be his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O oh Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns, my heart is wrung within me, because I have been very rebellious. In the street the sword bereaves, in the house it is like death. They heard my groaning, yet there is no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. You have brought the day you announced now let them be as I am. Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of my transgressions. For my groans are many and my heart is faint. I hope you can uh, feel that. That is, uh, you know, that's some suffering coming from the heart. Chapter 1, verse 1. It begins with this mournful acknowledgement that the once thriving city, you can picture a city like, you know, you go to, you see New York or any of these big cities where there's all this activity, hustle and bustle. It's alive, thriving with people, going about their business, doing their things. That was Jerusalem. This thriving, hustling and bustling, grand city, it is now deserted. It's been devastated. It's essentially empty. And this is, this is what's mourned. Though Jerusalem, it was once great among the nations, she now is like a widow in that she is lonely. And she's experiencing the pain of loss that a widow experiences in the loss of her, her husband. The great city that had once ruled nations like Moab and Edom during the reigns of David and Solomon, that once great city had now become a slave. And you see the pain that's evident Verse 2, you see the trauma is so great that in verse 2 she weeps bitterly through the night. This is a deep, inconsolable grief and suffering. The city is weeping through the night over what has happened to her. All the pagan nations with which she had formed alliances. See, trusting that they would get her through this storm of international politics, that's how it works, right? You have these nations, they're threatened, they see all these things, and you have the king, and he's going to go talk to people, and he thinks, he's judging, I have enough backing, I can do this, that will keep them from coming against me. Yeah, I've got my alliances and my friends, that's going to, all my lovers! Instead of repenting and trusting in God for protection. No, no, I'm going to live the way I want to, and I'll take care of it. I'll form alliances with nations, and together, you see... They will join in and they will protect me. Well, where are they now? You see, he says she weeps among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. They abandoned her as soon as it became expedient to do so. They were nowhere. They were no source of comfort to her. Jeremiah had told King Zedekiah, in Jeremiah chapter 37, verses 3 through 10, it says, King Zedekiah sent Jehuchel the son of Shelemiah and Zephaniah the priest, the son of Maaseiah, to Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Please pray for us to the Lord our God. Now Jeremiah was still going in and out among the people, for he had not yet been put in prison. 
the army of Pharaoh had come out of Egypt. And when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Oh, I can see what they're thinking, you see. Oh, no, no. Okay, you see, this is how it is. We've got certain things and we've got understandings with all of our good friends in the area. And as somebody said recently, nations don't have friends. They have interests. You see? That's why when politicians say, listen, I'm going to go and sweet talk some nation because they'll like me. They're just deluded. Nations have interests. You know, and they may smile and clap hands and this kind of stuff. But when it comes down to it, they weigh what is in my best interest. And here comes Egypt marching out, and I can just see Zedekiah thinking, okay, this is going to be it. They're going to chase off the Babylonians who are besieging the city and will be saved as I figured. Forget God, I've got it worked out. I've got an alliance over here. This is going to work. And Jeremiah says, it says the army of Pharaoh in Jeremiah 37 verse 5 had come out of Egypt and when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, thus shall you say to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of me, behold, Pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to Egypt to its own land, and the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city. They shall capture it and burn it with fire. Thus says the Lord. Do not deceive yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans will surely go away from us, for they will not go away. For even if you should defeat the whole army of Chaldeans, who are fighting against you. And there remained of them only wounded men, every man in his tent. They would rise up and burn this city with fire. What are you telling them? You're toast. (laughs) You see? You're toast. And it's perhaps not surprising that Jeremiah was imprisoned soon after that. You see, he says, listen, uh, don't trust in your lovers in your alliances, those you think you can go and hop in bed with rather than being faithful to me. I would have protected you, but you wouldn't come to me despite my pleas and urgings and sending prophets and telling you from the get-go you wouldn't have me. And don't think you're going to avoid the judgment I have promised through some kind of human alliance. In fact, Judah's so-called friends, they proved to be nothing of the sort. As soon as it became expedient to do so, they sided against her. And I can just see, whoever said, oh yeah, give it to him, Nebuchadnezzar. Oh yeah, that's terrible. What? Oh no, yeah, that's terrible. No, you're right, oh great king. Yeah, if I was there, that's what I'd do. You're great buddies. And this is part of the pain, you see. To be deserted and to be alone in suffering is part of the pain that the poet wants us to understand. Now in chapter 3, you see I changed this to uh, the the English Standard Version takes, there's a preposition in Hebrew that's flexible like many prepositions are. English Standard Version takes it as causal. And it says Judah has gone into exile because of affliction. A number of translations do that. I prefer taking it temporal, in a temporal sense. So Judah has gone into exile after affliction and hard servitude. And the point, it seems to me, is that after a time of hardship and forced servitude as the Babylonian vassal after 598, 597 B.C., when he puts Zedekiah on the throne, you know that when he's doing this, that he's extracting things from the city. If you're going to be my, you know, down here and you're serving me, you're my guy in there, well, he's got them serving him and working for him. So here they come after this difficult time of hardship and affliction of being forced to serve Babylonia. That's part of why they choose to rebel. But after that time, what happens? Well, that time of hardship and affliction winds up giving birth into an even worse state of exile in 586, 587, 586. She has been removed from the promised land and finds no rest. You see, life in exile, it's danger, it's turmoil, it's disruption. This kind of thing would drive me crazy. You know, I'm a routine kind of guy. 
And can you just see being uprooted and taken and carted off over to Babylonia and you're going to live there? You know, at, at, if they want to kill you, they'll kill you. If they want you to live in dirt, you live in dirt. And so all of this, there's no rest for them there. In the attempt of Jerusalem's men of war to flee after the city's walls had been breached, that was thwarted by the Babylonian pursuit. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. You remember that we read about the, the assault and how when the wall was breached, they, all the fighting men tried to get out. Not happening. And they were pursued and overtaken. Verse 4, the roads to Jerusalem that once were filled with pilgrims coming to the religious festivals. You can see the, the memory of these great days, these celebrations, this thriving, wonderful city. The temple of God is here. Pilgrims coming, thronging in. The gates are full. All the great times that we had with our family there. Living, growing up there, enjoying life. Seeing the vibrance, vibrancy of the city. He sits here and says, listen, all these roads that were once filled, they now mourn. Those roads mourn because they're, they're deserted. Nobody's coming to a festival here. This place is rubble. This place has been burned down. The gates of the city through which throngs once entered are now desolate. The priests groan because the temple which was the center of their life and activity has been destroyed. They're just left to sit here and, and groan. And the city's virgins, the young girls who've yet to marry, they grieve. They've been afflicted because they now face a greatly increased prospect of never marrying and never having a family. And as our, our society seems to be thinking that that's not a big deal. No, 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 who cares? You know, women need a man like a fish needs a bicycle to, to go back uh, some years to a bumper sticker. You see? But they understood, you see, that the prospect of not having family, and when you, people get older, they understand that. Family is a joy and a blessing. Now, does it get bent? Does it get twisted? I understand that. <laughs> we live in a fallen world. But I'm telling you, relationships in a family are a joy. And that's how they're intended. And these virgins saw the prospect of that for their lives vanishing. And so here they are. They are grieving. On verse, verse 5, it notes that Judah's foes had triumphed over her, having become her master, and they'd prospered at her expense, and then spells out why that it happened. Why did this happen? What is going on? Why have her foes come in? Didn't in 701, didn't God protect the city? Isn't this his place? Isn't this his turf? Isn't this a den of robbers? Well, we can hide out and live however we want, and God will protect us. Well, he spells it out here. The poet says, tells why this happened. Because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. The cup was full. You think you can sacrifice your children? Build altars in the courtyards of the temple? Images of pagan gods? After you, you, you basically are just turning around and spitting on me. Oh, isn't God big enough to handle people spitting on him? God? You're going to spit on God? It's just crazy. And so here's the poet recognizing, confessing, as he will do a number of other times, that the reason Jerusalem is in the terrible situation it is in now is because it rebelled against God. And that's a message. In fact, I think it's the primary theological point of the book, is that God will be faithful to his word of judgment. However long it takes him, God will be faithful to his word of judgment. Now, we've tried to, in our world and culture, we've tried to create a God, oh, he's too big to judge. It's as though we think that God, has, that God the Father has now become a Christian. You see, he would no longer judge. No, 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 I don't, I don't serve a God like that who would judge. That's God! <laughs> this is God! Right? This is the God we worship. We don't get the right to just sit and make caricatures of him. 
Oh, no, 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 that's not my God. Let me erase that and let me draw a God I find more palatable. I like this God who lets me defy him and live however I want but will never bring judgment. He's bringing judgment. He has told us repeatedly. Jesus in Revelation, you get the same image of treading the wine press with blood flowing. Judgment's coming. You see? And God wants people to understand it. You can't wish it away. You can't just sit there and say, no, I don't like that. Okay, well, you may not like gravity. But I'm telling you, step off the building and you're going down. I don't like it. You may not believe in it. But it's objective. And it's going to affect you. And here you see it. You just see what's happened here. This was God's promised punishment for their defiance and unfaithfulness. The city's inhabitants, her children, have gone into exile. Verse 6 says, all, all the majesty had departed from God's daughter, Jerusalem. All the majesty had departed from her. His beloved and precious city. God's beloved and precious city, where he had chosen of all the earth to have his special presence, his unique manifestation, to put his temple, all of her majesty had departed. It had gone from something that was grand, exalted, glorious, envied, to a wreck. That's what had happened to the great city. The city's once great rulers and leaders had been reduced by the siege to something like starving deer. You just see, and you'll see it pictured worse later, but you can just see, you know, eyes popping out and, and you know, have no pasture. That's what happened to them. Having put this... Put the city in peril by refusing to heed Jeremiah's advice to surrender in verse 30, chapter Jeremiah 38, verse 17. What did they do? They fled the city after they had done that. They fled the city, but they lacked the strength to avoid their pursuers. And what happened? The Babylonians took them. They put the city in peril. They refused yet again to listen to God telling them, forget you, we know, we are, you know, grand, great, Shut this guy up. And what happened? This is what happened. And they tried to slip out when the walls were breached and they were captured. Verse 7, it says that as Jerusalem suffered in exile, she remembered all the great things that were hers in prior days. You know, you, know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. You know that line? You can just see that, right? Because you just take things for granted. You take the very pulse of the city you think, no, this could never happen. This is, you know, this is too solid. We're in control. We're in control of nothing. <laughs> you have to see that. We're in control of nothing. And part of what I think was, the, the, part of the emotional response, I think, of 9-11 was it shook our sense that we are invincible. Yeah. You see, we are not invincible. No place, no city, Nothing. Everything is in God's hands. And so you sit here and you can see as they are exiled, they reflect back fondly on what they had during their prior days. Things that had been lost because of their rebellion. All the joys, all the celebrations, all the wonderful things provided by God that they took for granted and just treated Him like a dog. Now they look back and they go, man, man. Look what we've lost. Look what we have lost. When she was conquered, she was alone. And her enemies, they gloated over her defeat and they mocked her downfall. It wasn't like, you know, oh, you know, poor, poor city. And you understand how that feels, right? You know the difference between, like, for example, on 9-11 where we had uh, England and a bunch of other nations, everybody expressing sympathy for what had happened. And you know how you felt when you saw people celebrating what had happened, right? You saw people, different places. Maybe you had to go to alternate media to find this, but uh, you saw that. And there's a completely different reaction of people rejoicing in your sorrow and suffering. 
And see, so this is what, this is what the poet is trying to get. That's what happened. They went down, people they thought, whether they knew they were foes or not, supposed friends, foes, they were celebrating. Ha! Got you! You're down! Just what you deserved. Ha! 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 Ooh. That's not good. That's not a good feeling, see? That's like just rubbing your face in your suffering and sorrow. And that's part of it. Part of what they've experienced because of their rebellion. In fact, Obadiah is a prophecy against Edom for aiding the Babylonians against uh, her brother Jacob, Edom coming from Esau. And so you have that, you, you see that uh, they were just, you know, they, they were celebrating the destruction. And as were all the, the nations around. Verse 8 begins with the declaration, Jerusalem sinned grievously. She did indeed, right? That's why I went through all that stuff. I wanted you to hear all of that stuff. Because when I say Jerusalem sin grieves, you know, what's involved? All right, I wanted you to see it. So who can, who can deny that Jerusalem sinned grievously against God? Repeatedly against God? Overtly, defiantly, rebelliously? And God bore with them until the cup was full and then he said, destruction. Today is the day of judgment. I'm bringing the Babylonians. And they did what they did. As a result of that Jerusalem having sinned grievously, God punished her as, as a result of which, the result of that is that she went from being desirable and honored by the nations. You see, coming out, oh, this is a, whoa, what a fine city, what a great place. Yes, oh, you know, Jerusalem is a thriving economy. Hustling and bustling and up and coming. Not third world, as we would say. No, it was the center. It was really a prosperous uh, you know, nation, something like that city. Desirable. Honored by nations and other cities. It went from being that to what? Being filthy and despised. You see, from this great height, this great thing, now, now what do people look at it and it's just like, Phew. that's the reaction. You are like the stinkiest, worst thing I can think of. You are just despised. From up here to this. Why? Because we would not listen to the word of God. God spoke. He told us. And we ignored it. And if there's not a message in that, you see, what do we have? We have constant attempts to undermine Scripture. That's not God talking to you. That's not the word of God. Why is that? That is to get rid of that voice so then we can live the way we want. Well, what are you doing? You're simply rebelling against God. God is saying, I'm speaking into this creation. I'm telling you this. Okay. Well, what's the message here? The message here that there is inevitably a day of reckoning for rebellion against God. And you see here, his people suffering as a result of it. They suffered. This once great city was humiliatingly defeated. You see this whole thing here? It's like, for they have seen her nakedness. This is humiliatingly defeated, like having your private parts exposed to the world. That's what this is about. You see? Now maybe in our day we think that's cool. But I'm telling you, they understood you know, this is why when, you know, you had victors would strip captives. Why? Just humiliate them. That's why, to humiliate them. So this is what's being said here. This was humiliating. Our great strong city with its great walls and its great leaders and all of its money and all of that stuff. What has happened to it? God summoned the Babylonians and wiped it out. Wiped it out, humiliatingly defeated, so that all the city could do was what? Groan and turn her face away. You can picture that, right? Being held up in public, stripped naked, what, what your reaction would just be like, oh man. Right? This is poetry. He's giving you images of the suffering that they endured. Verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 9, says the city's uncleanness. You see, it's incompatibility with God. 
That's what, you know, the idea of something ritually unclean means it's incompatible with God. And so the city's uncleanness, its incompatibility with God is, and I took, you have to supply a verb there. Many of the translations su- supply was. I take present is, along with the New King James and the Jerusalem Bible. Its incompatibility with God is in her skirts. See, that's an odd thing. See, it's, it's in her skirts in the sense it was now out in the open where everyone could see it. If I may, uh, it is as though she bled through. Her, her uncleanness, her incompatibility with God had been exposed to the world because God had leveled this city. So now there's no, no question about it. What had happened? So here she is, this once great city. He says her un- incompatibility and cleanness is in her skirts. Jerusalem took no thought of her future. Listen to that. Took no thought of her future. She lived as though there would never be a day of reckoning. Didn't live as though, okay, you know, I, I can understand that there are consequences. There is a, no thought of the future. Just right here. This is what I want. I'm living me, me, me. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what I want to do. Aren't you thinking? <laughs> Aren't you thinking about the future? That there is a time of reckoning coming? You're living as though you don't. And that's what they did. They lived as though there would never be a day of reckoning. And therefore, what's happened? Because they lived without any thought of the future, because they lived as though there would never be a day of reckoning, they have now experienced this terrible, horrible fall. It is because they lived that way. If they had said, wait, God is God. He has told us. If they had had Josiah's reaction. But they didn't. And as a consequence... They've suffered greatly. Her suffering is so great, at the end of verse 9, she calls to the Lord to behold it. That's what this is. It's like, what? (laughs) Look at me! Look at what has happened to me! And it is an appeal for pity because of the tremendous devastation. Oh Lord, behold my affliction! Look at how I'm suffering! Look at all that has happened to me. Verse 10, verse 10 laments the plundering of the temple by pagans. Okay, but plundering of the temple by pagans. Not even Israelites who were not priests could enter the temple. But the fury of God against Jerusalem was so great that he made her watch the temple be treated with the kind of disrespect toward him that they had exhibited. Here we have the temple... The temple is holy. Not even the people of Israel who aren't priests can enter into it. But how do they treat God? Oh no, God is deserving of this great respect. You can't go into the temple. How are you treating him in your life? You're rejecting his word. You're living how you want to live in defiance of how he's called you to live. So I have something for you. You will now watch the nations treat me with the disrespect with which you have treated me. Watch as they plunder and destroy my dwelling place. And you just have to see, you have to see what this would mean, how this would affect the people. Now, in addition to that mental language, verse 11 refers to the starvation the people of Jerusalem endured during the siege of the city and no doubt afterward. Right? I mean, after they come in and level the city that they didn't have any food in it at that time, everything's burned down. What do you think people are going to be doing? Yeah, we're going to leave you guys here, the poorest of the poor. What do you think? You think all of a sudden, magically, there's food there? There wasn't a grocery store to go to. You couldn't bop down the fries. If it had been there, it had been leveled. So you know this suffering is ongoing. This starvation is ongoing. They groaned as they were forced to search for food. I've been hungry. You know, I've, I've been hungry. I've been hungry where... Piece of toast was a godsend. But I've never been like this. 
But they're searching for food. They're groaning as they search for food. And they were so hungry that they would surrender their most prized possessions in exchange for food to stay alive. It didn't matter. Food was the most important thing because I'm starving to death. Their most prized possession. Many commentators think this is alluding to even their children. Whatever I have, I don't care. I want food. See, that portrays starving and really what was going on in the city. The verse ends with, a, with another cry to God to see the depths of her suffering. Look, O Lord, and see, for I am despised. Look at my suffering and my sorrow. Has there ever been anything like this? Verse 12. Jerusalem calls on those passing by her ruins to take note of the magnitude of her sorrow which had been afflicted on her by the Lord in the day when he fulfilled his promise of judgment. It's like saying to the people going by, Will you look? Look at what God has done to me. See, people. This is the consequence of my rebellion. Look, there's never been anything like this. Stop and pause and look at the extent and the degree, the magnitude of suffering in this city. Because Almighty God has judged me. And so he calls, the city calls for them to look at it. Verse 13 says that God brought destruction on the city, fire into its bones, and spread a net to trap any of those who attempted to flee, thus turning them back into the fire. So he brings fire on the city. He's destroying the city. Sets a net here to trap anybody who's trying to get. Well, I can't go. Why? Because I'm trapped there. Driving them back into the fire. The city was demoralized. Left stunned and faint. These pictures. The city is stunned and faint. Verse 14. Verse 14 states, God turned Jerusalem's transgressions into a yoke upon its neck. He took the transgressions, he took the rebellion, he took the defiance of express specific commandments, and he fashioned that defiance into a yoke. You know what a yoke is, right? These guys, you know, they, you put it on ox and they pull together. It's an instrument of labor. And so what he has done, he has fashioned their transgressions into the yoke of their exile. Now where are they? Now they're serving the Babylonians. Why? Well, why did he tell them? He told them from the get-go. If you treat me like this, he told them over and over and over, and I went through that with you. Okay. Well, you think God's going to say all that? Nah. God was kind of hyping the situation. He wasn't really going to do what he said he would do. Well, here it is. <laughs> you see, faithful. See, great is thy faithfulness applies across the board. He is faithful to his word. And here he is being faithful to his word of judgment. And Jerusalem is suffering as a consequence of its rebellion. I heard that. Thanks. Thanks.